مارك مارك اي جست وونتد تو نو ذا شو اسمه اوكي خلص عقلي سكتت اوكي وي ار لايف ناو اوكي بيبل ار جيتنج ان اند وي ويل ستارت ذا فيديو ثانك يو جاد لك ثانك يو سو Are you innovating in the agri-food sector and looking for help? Now is your chance to join Veritech's accelerator program, Agritech. Our program provides entrepreneurs with the resources, support, knowledge, and funding needed to transform their idea into a sustainable business in less than a year. During this year, you will be provided with technical guidance to develop your solution in the most cost-effective and efficient way. In the first phase of the accelerator, you will discover your customers and build a solution for their problem. You'll get trained by leading experts and receive up to $2,000 to set the foundations for your product. The second phase of the program is probably the most interesting. We will select the most promising startups and help them transform their concepts into reality. For four months, you will receive up to $15,000 to develop your first product, test it, and get your first sale. Phase three is the growth and incubation phase. We will help you become investment ready and help you take your idea to the next level with up to $20,000 in matching grants. We have real challenges that need real solutions in the agri-food sector in Lebanon. This is our opportunity to make a difference. So we are looking for motivated entrepreneurs ready to create, innovate, and lead the change we need in this sector. Did you get your attention? Then apply to the Agritech program and join Beritech in leading the agri-food revolution in Lebanon and the region. Hello, everyone. Is it our turn, Suha? Just a, just a quick note. Um, my name is Yumna Nofal. I'm a Beirut-based journalist, and I just want to say I am very uh, grateful to Barry Tech for this opportunity. This is our third session. We did three Tuesdays in a row. So, hi, yeah, thank you for for putting this together, and um, really trying to highlight with Barry Tech the importance of the agricultural sector in trying to address the economic woes of Lebanon. As everybody knows, Lebanon is going through one of the hardest periods of all time. And there's so much potential in the agricultural sector that hasn't been untapped yet. It's a resource that is really gaining momentum, uh, gained momentum through 2020 and through 2021. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about this series. So today, the title of our session is Food Processing, Marketing and Distribution in the Agri-Food Sector. But I wanna tell you a little bit about the Agri-Tech Learning Series and then the program. So the agri-food sector, according to many experts, is the only rescue for Lebanon out of the economic crisis. Now, while of course, a lot of challenges are facing the sector, challenges means opportunities. Through this series, we will connect entrepreneurs, innovators, engineers, creative minds with the reality of the agri-food sector. It's suffering from a lack of technology, low efficiency, lack of funds, specifically with the devaluation of the local currency. So the food processing sector used to face a lot of competition because it was mostly relying on imports. But today, the tendency to rely on local producers is giving it a great opportunity and a great chance to grow. So to get a clearer idea on what is needed today, we are hosting experts, which I will introduce to you in one second. But before I wanna tell you about the program, the AgriTech Accelerator Program, which is part of, which this series is part of, is a three-phase program a yearly three-phase program through which Berrytech supports startups with innovations across the sector, offering them resources, knowledge, and funding to scale up their ideas and turn them into an internationally successful, hopefully, business. At the end of the three phases program, um, you get 
startups exit with a validated investment ready business. So phase one is two months business validation phase with a grand total of $2,000 per team. This is where capacity building happens. 24 startups are there to ensure that their solutions solve a problem, are scalable, and of course that they can basically take care of the challenges. Phase two is a four month business acceleration phase with a grand total of $15,000 per team. In this part, Support comes to 12 startups to build the minimum viable product and test it with early adopters, capacity building to try to establish the business from a financial marketing management and operational level. Phase three, three is a five months incubation and growth phase with a matching grant total of up to $20,000 per team. This is where there is support for up to eight startups in scaling, including hands-on fundraising, support in negotiation, legal terms, sheets, and market access. The application for the program is open till January 31st. So you have about four days, if I'm correct, five days till it's over. So make sure you apply if you qualify. And good luck to all the teams. Our speakers today are here to talk about food processing. I want to start by introducing Fadi Fayad, the director at Fayad Food Consulting. He graduated with a master's degree in food processing and management from AUB, started his career in 1980 and contributed in 1984 to the establishment and management of Al Wadi Al Akhdar, a renowned manufacturer and distributor of foodstuff. Since then, he has accumulated over 30 years of professional experience in Lebanon and abroad and is presently director of Fayad Food Consulting, which he founded in 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Fadi Fayyad. Our second speaker is Gabby Bayram, the Technical Advisors on Value Chain and Market Development at USAID Agricultural and Rural Empowerment Program. Gabriel is currently serving as the Value Chain and Market Development Advisor on USAID, Lebanon's $56 million flagship agricultural development program in the country. He has over 16 years of experience in the technical program strategy, design, and implementation of workforce development and economic growth programming for international development agencies and implementers in the Middle East, Central Asia, and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Gabriel, known as Gabi Beidam. Our third speaker is Hil Skaff, a food and business development specialist and an independent consultant. She is a food production and business development professional with more than 15 years experience in long-term positions and short-term consultancies. Her experience includes six years of progressive leadership on the USAID funded DAI implemented Lebanon industry value chain development project, strengthening the agriculture and agro processing sectors and supporting Lebanese products to become even more competitive in both domestic and international markets. Ladies and gentlemen, Hil Skaff. And last but not least, we have Jada Atala, the co-founder and CEO of USA in Canada at Smart Gourmet. He's responsible for managing and leading numerous teams in highly competitive industries, cutting edge markets with complex environments. Excellent technical skills have allowed him to, be, to, to do very well in strategic planning, business unit development, project management, and system engineering strategies. He provides accurate assessments of organizational business requirements, identifies deficiencies and potential business opportunities, and has developed strongly, strong, highly successful strategies that improve further advanced company growth and brand image. So Jad Atalla, for all those listening, is probably also one of the contacts that you can network with, hopefully today and afterwards, um, if you need mentorship, if you need advisory. Jad, I'm speaking on your behalf. I'm sorry. I'm just... I just feel like this is such a good this is such a good opportunity to connect our speakers to our attendees because I feel that with these Zoom meetings and allow me I say this every time so I'm sorry I sound like a broken record but you miss the face to face networking we you know the the ability to be able to ask you so many questions and and I I I have so many of these attendees that email me afterwards and say can we reach out to the speaker so hopefully with your approval all four of you will be able to do that if you're okay. Gabby, Fadi, Hill, and Jad, yes? Yes, true. Okay. Definitely. All right, see, 
I like I like the woman encouragement here. Hill, it's <laughs> nice to have it's nice to have a woman on the team. It's I'm so special. happy to be invited first, and I'm I'm all about women empowerment. So all of the attendees, women and men, if they feel they have questions, just shoot, shoot it now, later, whatever you want, guys. Yes, please feel free to connect with all our speakers. And if you need anything, I always put my email and all my social media accounts. Please reach out to me, um, and let's keep the conversation going. So I want to start today uh, with a question for any of you, whoever wants to answer, not all at the same time. You know, we used to rely a lot on imported food. This was a big problem for Lebanon, which really, when you think about it, doesn't make sense considering the great uh, quality of produce and foods that we have in the country. Our supermarket shelves were full of products from all over the world, but this is changing hopefully for the better. I just want to know, how is this change affecting the Lebanese food industries? And are they going to be able to supply the market with all the needs? Speakers, whoever wants to go first. If ladies first, I don't mind Hill starting. <laughs> I don't, Fadi, do you want to start or I start? It's up to you or whatever, whoever wants to start, I'm fine with it. <laughs> Okay, so basically I think uh, import substitution is a key thing right now for all Lebanese food industries because one, it's driving them to invest more in product that they weren't doing before, that's one. And even their uh, equipment, uh, they were targeted to one product, but now that equipment can be used for multiple products so they can actually maximize capacity and increasing uh, their production capacity, not only maximizing it to support local, uh, uh, local production. Okay, so I think import substitution is a key thing and it's a good opportunity for all Lebanese industrial to start uh, doing it. Okay, because as you said, uh, we have a lot of raw material here um, from an agricultural perspective, there's a lot of question mark on what we don't have. And this is a discussion that we started, for example, with Jad prior to the prior to this discussion, like the vine leaves. We need vine leaves. We, we sell a lot of vine leaves, but for unfortunately, not a lot of farmers in Lebanon plan that in order for us to use it for uh, food processing or stuffed vine leaves or regular vine leaves. So yes, in my opinion, uh, import substitution is a good trigger for Lebanese um, industrial to invest in Lebanon. And also when they are investing in a product for import substitution, other products come along for export market addressing a gap, especially that Mediterranean diet is really trending. All Mediterranean ingredients, all the hubs, the vibes of the Mediterranean diet is going everywhere, not only to a specific market. So yes, in my humble opinion in that, I believe that import substitution is a great, uh, is a great way for the Lebanese industry to start investing in. Um, can we, is it gonna be, is there gonna be enough supply to, to, for the market for, for all our needs? This is something that we need to, uh, we know that we don't have raw material in Lebanon. This goes to the increase in prices as well. So the raw material does not exist. So the plan, the strategic plan that industries should do and along with the government, that we should have a plan to invest in raw material, either agricultural commodities, either packaging and, and different raw material. Definitely there will not be supply to supply the local demand because you don't have enough. But the strategy is for you to, to, uh, to invest in that so we will be able to have also competitive advantage in export market, not only in the local market. Right. So I think strategy has to be adopted. Uh, but again, this is something that goes back to us as industries and the government itself. Um, Fadi do you, or Gabby, do you want to add anything to what Hill said? Yes. I, um, yes, go ahead, Fadi. That's okay. Um, uh, I agree with what Hill said, but I think, um, I think we're still... Um, in a step behind in this one, because if, I mean, if you look at what's happening on the market today, uh, some imported products are disappearing, but they are being replaced by other imported products that are cheaper from countries like regional countries. So it's not that the local production is until now replacing. One of the reasons could be the subsidy of the central bank, which is making imports still cheap. Okay. So when this subsidy is gone, maybe the situation would be different. But I think today it's too early to say that the, the, the uh, definitely there are opportunities, but if you say, like you said, the challenges are now bigger, but those challenges could also create opportunities. Now, uh, what Hill said about raw materials, she's correct 100%. If you want, most, of the, most of the food products uh, that we buy 
have a, a cost of 50, 60, maybe to 80% impact on the raw material. Mm -hmm. so, so the raw material is very important in the, in the final cost. Not all products, but most of them. So in Lebanon, we are, that's why in Lebanon, we, uh, we were okay in the industry because we were competing with expensive products, which are imported. So we were able to say we could produce. But even since, even if, I mean, even, um, I don't think that the reason why the industry was not operating well is because there was only only important products. It's because the industry in Lebanon, uh, the, the structure of Lebanon is not today made for an industry, for to the food industry. So we cannot be competitive in accepting very special food products. This, of course, is going to change because of the uh, currency devaluation. So because we are obliged today to, to focus more on local uh, material, even though the local material is also increasing, uh, I mean, with, with the currency increase. Um, so it's not, I don't see it, as, I see it as an opportunity, of course, I see it as the future for the food industry, but I don't see it something happening tomorrow morning. I think this is going to be- um, it's a process. It's a process. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. process which has to be, uh, I mean, it has to be, um, um, uh, it has to, I mean, the, first the parameters has to be clear, which are not yet, all the parameters in the country are not clear, how to get financing, uh, what are the subsidies on the import products, um, uh, what raw materials are available, agriculture and so on, maybe Gabby can tell us more about agriculture. Yeah, I want to get, I want to get to Gabby, to that. Yeah. First of all, I, allow me to say, Gabby, loving your background, oh, very, thanks, thanks, very, thanks. very thin friendly. I wish we all had, you know, the tractor and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. Luckily, there's no wind you, today, so it's easy to hear. You went all the way. Um, Gabby, you've heard, you heard what Hill and Fadi were saying. Um, obviously, these substitutions and the fact that we're just going to start relying on local, um, local products makes more sense just for the economy and everything, but there seems to be a lot of shortage when it comes to the knowledge that we have and the ability to, to access and to get it right. So what mm. do you want to add to what they were saying? So, I mean, I guess, I, I guess what I wanna kind of get across is the why. Why did things change? And yeah. I can tell you the number one reason is economics and it's currency devaluation. Right. It really comes down to a jar of tomato sauce coming from Turkey used to cost uh, 3,000 which is $2, it now costs 16,000. And that means producers here can produce her cheaper relative to you know, the local market. So it really comes down to economics and it comes down to you know, local, you know, the, the devaluation. It just made Lebanon more competitive. I mean, right now the agricultural sector is actually, is actually booming in terms of exports. I mean, oranges, you can't even find oranges in the market anymore. They all go to Iraq. Go find an orange juice, go, find, go talk to an orange juice processor and ask them how hard it is to find oranges. Yesterday, I saw Egyptian oranges for the first time in, our, in, in the market here. It's because, because of the, the economy has become much more competitive in terms of pricing. Right. Now, in terms of sourcing, it's, it's a problem. And I don't, you know, I mean, we have to all remember we live in an extremely, extremely small country. And our, you know, the production systems that we're kind of using now are not going to fulfill are you know what the agriculture industry needs in order to scale so we're going to have to look at improved production systems in terms of you know uh controlled atmosphere greenhouses just better varieties with better yields and just better better production so we can you know produce more uh for for our agro for our agro processors or we're going to have to open up some kind of uh you know some, you know we're going to have to accept outside of fruits and vegetables for processing and for export uh, in terms of like agriculture free zones and things like that. But uh, that might be another kind of another discussion, but. Um, I mean, you um, know, you know what I find mind boggling? It's, I still don't understand it. And please, anybody feel free to come in, um, Jad, Hill, Gabi, or Fadi, is that why was Lebanon importing to start with, right? I mean, when, when people come and visit us from abroad, when, when, and they have, they taste our fruits or vegetables or, you know, what the, you know, our locally produced items, there is always, there, you know, you always hear compliments about how they taste better than abroad. And, you know, I can personally testify to that, that everything tastes better here when it comes to local produce than it does in the US, mm. for example, right? Sure. 
So why, you know, it's funny that this change is happening now. And it, as, as you said, Gabby, it's because of the economy and the devaluation of the, the local currency. And obviously prices have shot up. We're going to get to that in one second. But for years and years and years, we were importing. What, why was this happening? Anybody, please, come, you know, when we have what we need here, why? I mean, Anybody, please come in. I can, I can it depends that. what you're talking about. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Fadi. Okay. Uh, um, we were importing because it was cheaper to import than to produce locally. And uh, um, in, in the Lebanon, when we say importing, we were, we were mainly importing either luxury items or mainly raw material, whether yeah. packed in bulk or packed in small items. If you look at Lebanon, what Lebanon is strong in the uh, in the catering business and how to, we transform the raw material into food, which is eaten fresh, not processed. So we are very strong. We are not importing ready to eat products. We are not importing products that um, need to be uh, uh, worked on. We are producing mainly the minimally processed products or raw materials. So we buy peas, we buy tomato paste, we buy uh, um, mushrooms, but we are not buying like, yeah. So we are very, very strong in the other business where there's more added value because we are a small country and any product that we produce without a big added value, we are not, we are not being competitive. So producing, I can give you a very simple example is producing tomato paste in Lebanon, where we import thousands and thousands of tons of tomato paste. We, we, it's not feasible because we don't have enough tomatoes. Our, our, our tomatoes do not give us a, a cost of tomato paste, which is cheaper than the import. Same thing in peas, green peas, and so on, frozen items, and so on. So uh, basically, uh, we, we imported because it was convenient to import. It wasn't, like a, it wasn't like a mistake. It was convenient at that time to import. Now, if you don't have money anymore to import, of course, we have to go start producing our own. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we are going to miss a lot of products. And this is... Uh, the, the opportunity today of this uh, whole mess is that the, the, the food industry could have a chance today to become competitive because, uh, because people now are more willing to invest in it because they're going to make money through it. I want to continue because we're going to start taking questions from the audience, but I just want a chance for Jad to speak. And Jad, you can, you can add to that or you can also answer, answer me because our speakers have mentioned so far and... and this is the, uh, the, the figure that I have, is the prices of food products have increased 423% since September 2019. From September 2019 till November 2020, food prices have increased 423%, including the local produced products. Uh, I mean, okay. Uh, uh, go uh, ahead. Good day, everyone. So uh, I think the main reason is the devaluation of the Lebanese currency against the US dollar uh, is the main factor. Um, raw material uh, uh, costs, uh, uh, they are imported and paid in US dollar. Uh, raw materials availability. So there is no uh, uh, more uh, raw materials. Uh, uh, importers are not importing uh, 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 raw materials uh, uh, enough to supply uh, uh, for the market, um, uh, the greediness of the importers to profit maximum from the chaotic situation and the fading presence of the governmental body observing and controlling the logical increase in the raw material price. So I think uh, the problem uh, is uh, 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 doubling by having this economical situation in Lebanon. Uh, we're not being able uh, to uh, uh, to get uh, our raw material. I, I gave an example uh, before yeah. starting, let's say in the hummus industry, uh, we use a lot of uh, oil and uh, the, uh, uh, the oil price has uh, maybe uh, tripled. So uh, uh, definitely the production is, uh, is still uh, 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 cheap, producing in Lebanon, but the raw material price is, is uh, skyrocketing. So uh, definitely right. we need to increase the pricing. I'm gonna start taking a few questions from the audience and, and anybody from our panelists can, can answer. I, I love, by the way, attendees, please feel free to send your questions. I will make sure that the speakers answer all of them. 
Hassan, you Yumna, can I add? Yes, go can ahead. I add one go more ahead. thing just yes. before we take the question. So uh, what Shadi was saying in terms of import substitution and we have shortage, that's definitely, but that's the strategy of uh, now the food industry, what they're looking for is they're actually working with farmers that they haven't worked before and they didn't have contract forwarding on any of that to start working on increasing their raw material being purchased from Lebanon instead of importing it. Stuff like eggplant used to get frozen. Now they're trying to build it, to plant it here. Other like such corn, uh, other uh, raw material that they used to import or take it from anywhere in the world. Now they're trying to do it. And this is a strategy that the food industry, at least the ones I'm working with, probably others, they're, they're working in a different business model, but this is what it, they're trying to do. And in terms of raw material, as Jad said, it's very important to highlight that the increase in prices is coming almost I don't want to give a percentage of why it's from raw material because we know that um, the labor is still in LDP and they are still paying in LDP and their overhead energy and all of that. But the raw material itself, if the if the jar of the tomato paste by itself is getting paid in dollar, you're paying the, the highest percentage of it. It's, bus, it's because of your packaging. Not to go into the, the actual tomato, as Fadi said, the concentrated tomato that were being purchased and not only the tomatoes. So this increase is, this is how it's justified because all the industries are paying in dollars, especially now with the bank situation and everything. So it's making, it's making it very hard on them. Uh, yani Jad is already sharing his, uh, his agony <laughs> in the raw material. Yeah, thing. and so are, so are our attendees, by the way. Some of them- Yes, some of them, I'm just checking the questions. <laughs> some of them seem <laughs> upset. Let's just yeah. start, let's, let's start tackling their questions. Um, I'm gonna start with Ghassan Kuzah or Koza, I hope I'm saying this right. He says, with the need for fresh dollars, will producers start to favor exports over the local market, like our oranges going to Iraq? What will happen to the local demand? Who wants to take this one? I mean, the answer is short Gabby? answer, yes. Go ahead, Gabby. <laughs> Go ahead, Gabby. I yeah. mean, I mean, our, you know, to be honest, producers generally around the world always favor exports because usually you can get a higher price. And generally the favor in Lebanon has always been toward exports, just that they couldn't access those export markets in the past because of price. And now with the devaluation, they're able to access it based on, based on price. So, I mean, and you're gonna run into a problem, you know, I mean, you're gonna see a lot of uh, product, what you're gonna see is our products going out, or you're gonna see, um, you know, oranges, for example, being much more, you know, 15, 20 thou a kilo, because that's what they can either sell it here or they can sell it to Iraq. Or you're gonna see substitute uh, lower quality um, products coming into the country from other places that normally we did not import from. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, I mean, that's kind of economics, you know? I mean, it happens everywhere. It happened to quinoa 15 years ago. Quinoa used to be just eaten only in Bolivia and Peru. And then all of a sudden it became a global, you know, a global trend and people in Bolivia and Peru couldn't afford to eat quinoa anymore. So they started eating something else or it, it just became too expensive. And, so, and that's just kind of the, I mean, that's just how economics kind of works in free trade. Right. Um, go ahead. Yomna, just to add on, Gay, uh, on Gabby, giving quinoa as an example. For example, yeah. friki is a very good example. Why? Because now there's a trend on ancient grains, quinoa, barley, buckwheat, uh, yeah. is one of them. So for example, we are working with a lot of industries here in Lebanon to plant with farmers for friki and not only selling it as a grain, it's actually selling it as ready to eat, as a yes. parboiled product. And it's really doing well. So people are, or at least food industries are, are understanding the crisis and putting action to develop an innovative product that uh, answers a gap in specific markets and not going with the regular commodity, which I, I don't disagree. I don't, I'm not saying that we, don't, we shouldn't go with the commodity, but, go, but always answering a challenge in a market or a gap in a market that would be uh, getting a product with a higher profit margin and a more innovative product. So but, this is, exactly yeah. is one of them, but definitely we have to go back to raw material where you should plant friki. Definitely we don't have a lot of land that are not- I love, you know, I love that you said that. I would pick friki over quinoa any day, by yes, the way. Exactly. And this is not, and this is not because I'm Lebanese, but well, maybe partly, I don't want to lie. <laughs> but, but really, uh, it, it's just, again, it goes back to the, you know, I understand, I understand that you speakers are saying that it's the economic, obviously the way economics work, 
you know, it's a turn and now we're in a slump and it's a crisis, like the, the likes we've never seen in a long time. And the, you know, and I want to get to the pandemic and how that's affecting also uh, products and production, but there's so much, and I think this is why Berry Tech came up with the series. There's this, this is such a resource that's been untapped and there's so much to do with it. And there are so many challenges and I wanna to get to that and how we find solutions so that we can actually grow the sector and start benefiting from it, whether it's as Lebanese or also maybe maybe exporting is a thing for us. Um, let me just take one last question from the audience before we continue. Karine El Tef is asking, Karine, I just wanna say you've been asking every single session. So thank you for your participation. As industrialists, has the current situation encouraged you to partner, sign contracts with a larger number of local producers, ensuring part of your needed raw material and granting them higher market security? Who wants to take this? Actually, this is, uh, 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 Yumna, this is what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to uh, uh, contract with, uh, with uh, farmers right now to uh, uh, plant, uh, act plant, where uh, contracts are secure. So we buy all the uh, uh, outcome from, uh, from them, uh, uh, um, for say for the for the eggplant for the uh, uh, let's say uh, we use vine leaves and we have many other products that we're gonna use in the future. So this is the the the, the way to go right now. So uh, we're uh, uh, simulating farmers who plant uh, special seeds uh, by by uh, signing with them uh, 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 to buy all their uh, uh, produced products uh, for the whole year. Uh, so we're trying, we're trying, it's not easy, uh, convincing uh, uh, farmers to change uh, 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 the seed they plant uh, and, and uh, uh, having some helps as well from many programs from the USAID as well. Uh, they are helping farmers uh, uh, by uh, providing for them uh, funding uh, to buy the seed and we're providing them the security of buying uh, all their uh, products produced. Hill, you wanted to add? Yes, and not only that, because I'm saying uh, there's, there's a lot of questions yeah. on contract farming. Uh, actually, again, I'm speaking uh, based on my experience with food industries that I'm working with, and definitely with the panelists, they know other examples as well. Not only the food industry are doing contract farming, but they are actually hiring agriculture engineers to train them to get what exactly they want. And this was never done before in setting product specification, and what type of product that we need. That's one. And not only on contract farming only, because there's also a lot of producers, uh, they're working with smaller producers to get their produce uh, because they cannot do the product for some reason. Is it far away or uh, it needs a lot of uh, like very authentic product. So they're working with smaller producers, training them, making sure they're hygienic, food safety perspective and all of that and buying from them. Really, there's really positive uh, initiative and positive vibes along with such a crisis and economically and uh, and uh, pandemic. I, I have always positive vibes. I always like to see really the initiatives <laughs> being done. I, I know there's a lot of uh, constraints. I'm not saying, I'm not living in La La Land. I'm not saying the, the world mm -hmm. is beautiful, but there's a lot of initiatives being done and the industries are understanding and, gra and grasping that. F from my perspective, again, uh, Fadi, do you agree with me? I, I, no, I don't no. want to be the only one who's being so positive. <laughs> no, no, it's good to be positive. Yeah, it's good. No, I mean, if you allow me just to uh, answer both questions first, I mean, quickly. On the export side, yes, uh, I, I, I believe that companies are going towards export and that export is the healthy way out now uh, for the food industry. But this doesn't mean that we, uh, the local market is not going to be an important uh, market, but it's, uh, it's going to be not, not even an important market, but also a, a necessary market for the competitiveness of the industry. But export today is bringing fresh money. It's also it is what uh, is encouraging those uh, contract farming things because what the head is saying, I think this also is the solution if we ever want to get raw materials because getting local raw materials is not enough. The getting raw local raw materials with the right specification is what's needed. <clears throat> and the specification of the industry <clears throat> excuse me, is not necessarily the specification of the market. Okay, so basically, um, um, I agree that, uh, this is the, that this is the trend and this is how it should be. 
So uh, it's a healthy thing what's going on now, but it's going on a very slow pace and it's re it needs a lot of uh, investment. Yes. Uh, and, uh, on, on, a positive, Yumna, on a positive note, Yumna, distributors, yeah. food processor distributors, mm. if, if I had, for example, a company who wanted a distributor to work with, it used to take a lot of time. Yes, this product fits out. No, yes, no. Okay. But now distributors are following up with food industries to work with them because they want a locally produced product. So this is part of the positive vibes I'm trying to, yeah. I'm trying to say. Because the, the, the I, like, I like the positive vibes. I think yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. have a problem with them. No, I, 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 I'm seeing the questions of Atenzi. I know we are in a crisis. That's yeah. nothing to um, to be positive about. But the crisis has a positive. Yeah, and it encourages industries to think outside the box and to take things that they haven't approached it before. Industries, retailers, distributors, uh, farmers. Yeah, right. Najat is a good example on that. Let's, uh, for, let, on let's that. keep going. I just so, want to say, please, to our attendees, please yeah. write your questions in the Q&A box because there's a lot of chat and a lot of questions and it gets confusing. So please write your questions in the Q&A box. Jad, you wanted to add something? Yeah. No. Uh, well said, well said. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Hi, Dar can, can uh... Yeah, go ahead. Gabby, please. <laughs> Yeah, I just want so I want to add uh, just two things just so because I, I, you know, I have to be mindful of the audiences for people that want to apply to the agritech program. Yes. And, you know, one thing they should, you know, realize is that processed crops or for processing crops are different than in the fresh market. And generally speaking, in Lebanon, we grow for the fresh market. Right. So and usually processed crops do not bring the same, I guess we call it farm gate price, meaning the price the farmer receives as fresh market crops. So there's, again, it's economic to look at. You know, you might go tell a farmer, please grow these Roma tomatoes for me. Mm. And they're not gonna get the same, uh, you know, income they would get from growing fresh market tomatoes. And it's, and you know, that applies across the board to pickles, applies to eggplants, applies to, applies to tomatoes. So that's one thing um, you need to be mindful of. Second is kind of to go back a bit to these, um, this increase in food prices and, and the cost of, of, of fruits and vegetables. I mean, we have to recognize that inputs of, most of our input supplies, if not all, are imported and they're imported at the dollar rate. So what has happened is the cost of seeds, you know, our, our seeds, our varietals are imported from Turkey, from Holland, are on the dollar rate. So we are, you know, the farmers are paying more for their seeds and that gets kind of pushed into, you know, the prices of the, of, of the vegetables. What used to cost, you know, them 70,000 last year, cost them 500,000 now for a packet of seeds. It's the same for fertilizers, pesticides, potting soil for the nurseries. So those are, you know, those are huge, huge constraints facing the, uh, facing the agriculture sector right now. It's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, I need to add something as well. The increase as well in the price is in the packaging. The packaging is imported. All the mm -hmm. packaging is imported mm -hmm. as well. So uh, we're paying uh, maybe uh, three times more in fresh dollar for the packaging. The printing, the label itself, you're paying no, in dollars. Exactly. That's the simple thing, not only a package in the glass jar on the carton or something. But Jumna, another example, just to say on Gabi, uh, a previous project that I, uh, that I used to work with, the uh, DAI and IVCD project, just to differentiate between the cucumbers for the pickles as fresh and processed food. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Three companies, three local companies supported and worked mm. with the project to develop a variety of cucumbers that is only used for food service uh, and the, uh, for the burgers, for the fast food. And for the first time in Lebanon, and I'm, I'm saying that was in 2018, 2019, a local company wins the bid to and start, instead of importing the dill pickles, they started in supplying it in Lebanon. It took us it took us a time to convince the farmer to plan the new variety for the industry to follow up from their agricultural engineer to get the to get the right proper but it was done and it's very successful Hello, okay with the pandemic there's no food service but it's going to come back and we're not staying in that situation forever from a pandemic perspective it's you know it's 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 interesting because we talk a lot about lebanese specialities that are done manually and traditionally and I want to start talking about moving forward. So where do you see opportunities in adding value to Lebanese traditional food or industrializing to make it exportable, for example? I go first. I, I'm the one who talks a lot. So <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm, 
She likes you because of the poster. Yeah. <laughs> that's not the true. Poster. <laughs> that's true. That's not true. I like you all equally. I, I wish I could meet all of you. We're going to keep we this will, conversation we will going. After this pandemic. Hey, go, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not, I'll talk later. <laughs> no, okay, let me start this one a little bit. Um, first, Leb I mean, Lebanese traditional products or, or specialties uh, are actually a mixture of different sources of, of the regional countries here. I mean, it's not really Lebanese. It's Lebanese, uh, Palestinian, Jordanian, Syrian, Turkish. This is, but we have, we were able in Lebanon to, uh, to develop them in a way, uh, in a way that makes them more um, app appetizing, more appealing to the uh, international consumer. That's why, if, uh, I mean, we, we hear a lot about the Lebanese cuisine, which has been, which is now becoming more international. It's because of these specialities. Uh, also because of our uh, food service uh, uh, sector, not only about the industrial sector. So it, definitely it is an important aspect uh, of, of, of the industry be, to focus on because um, it has also more added value um, and, uh, and because we don't have a lot of competition or, or the competition is is, is, is not as big as in other products. So definitely we need to, um, uh, to, to, to encourage such products and we need to uh, help them export. Now, many of those traditional products, as you said, were, are done manually. Um, and so which, this is a plus, but also it's a problem in, in, the, in terms of cost. Okay, uh, we cannot, uh, we need, we, we are exportable products, so we should focus on exporting them and make them more exportable, but making them more industrial, I don't think this is a, 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 a must, or it's a, a, a inevitable need because sometimes you cannot without destroying their value, without destroying their traditional value. So we need to make them competitive without really destroying their, um, their, their traditional value. And this is uh, where I think is the challenge, but it's happening slowly. It's, it's usually done in Lebanon, not through the big industries. It's done through the small co-ops and small uh, producers and where you have lots of women and uh, very skilled women actually. And this, and this, is, this, is, the, this is the capital of this business. Uh, it's the skilled people. And it's the fact that we have uh, most of the raw material available, even though they are not in a, cheap, uh, the cost is not cheap, but we have all the varieties available, right. so we can produce anything we want. All right. So, uh, uh, yeah. okay. I so, want to, I want to keep going with questions because there are, there are a few for all of you and okay. our, our attendees are really, really participating and thank you for that. Uh, Gabby, I think this is for you. Iman Hani asking, most of our agricultural land is not exploited. What if NGOs such as USAID support preparing and planning these lands? Uh, sure, and actually, I mean, USAID is doing that uh, on a couple other programs where they do irrigation infrastructure, canals, water, uh, and things like that. But I mean, the main, the key to um, all of that is the sustainability and the maintenance of that you know, after the project's finished. And that is some issues that you will find around the country, um, meaning that the government has to take it over, the government has to maintain it, or the local community, someone has to maintain it. And so, you know, the short answer is yes. I mean, it's agriculture infrastructure is probably one of the most important things we need to do here in terms of, you know, getting better irrigation, getting water to the land, uh, making sure, you know, our roads, um, are, are okay. So, you know, the crops don't get damaged when they're going to market. Um, but, you know, that comes hand in hand with the ability for, um, I guess, community or government to uh, maintain it, to, you know, sustain it beyond one year or two years of the life of the program. So that, those are, that's the constraint, I would say, to, uh, to, you know, kind of big infrastructure programs. Uh, All right. It's the government, the ability to maintain. So, and to, to add to that, it's interesting you mentioned the government because Fatima Lali is asking, and this is open to all our speakers, don't you think that the government Ministry of Agriculture should play a better regulatory role? I understand we need the fresh dollars. However, the general public is struggling to pay the inflated rate since the minimum wage hasn't officially been adjusted yet. And I think this is, she speaks, 
she speaks Bravo. on behalf of all of us when yes, she 100%. says that. Thank you for your question, mm -hmm. Fatima. Um, so don't you think that the government ministry of our culture should play a better regulatory role without entering politics here? Who wants to answer that? Um, yes. <laughs> that would be very hard. <laughs> no, but I mean, um, um, here, uh, because I have, I have worked with the Minister of Agriculture, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they, have, uh, they are playing a regulatory role. The problem is that um, the, the situation the, the situation in the country and the, the agriculture sector being such a, 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 a non-structured sector still, um, you have lots of small farmers, you have lots of small uh, people, producers, it's difficult for the Ministry of Agriculture to really apply those rules. Uh, one, uh, some of these rules are linked to uh, pesticide residues, some are linked to uh, the, uh, the pesticides we use, and some are linked also to um, practices and good agriculture practices. But still, there is a, a, an effort that has been done by the Ministry of Agriculture, but with not with much results because uh, the, the, the outreach is not so easy to all the farmers. Uh, second, we have also uh, a problem with the Ministry of Agriculture. Where, where it's, it's also, uh, the, it lacks resources, it lacks um, uh, uh, focus and so on. So, uh, so it's not more regulations to answer the question that we need. It's more mm -hmm. uh, guidance. It's more uh, support to the to the support, farmers. Support presence. Yeah, yeah presence exactly. Focus Other than on putting it. more mm -hmm. regulation. Yeah. Right. Do you? Well, here's the question. Then let me let me ask it a different way. Do you think that is likely to happen? Considering you know, without entering the politics of it, unfortunately, no. the politics of it is today. If you go corrupt. to the minister, to the minister of agriculture now, this they have and, and the minister they have established a very ambitious five-year strategy mm -hmm. for the agricultural sector. Now, um, I attended the, the, the seminar that was done by the right. minister, and it looks very, very interesting as a strategy, but from my experience, it's yeah. going to, it is very theoretical. How are they going to apply? And uh, the, minister, uh, uh, the minister himself approves, I mean, uh, confirms that they don't have money for this one thing. And, uh, and I know they don't have also enough resources other than money, the people. Uh, but at least the intention is there. I mean, the strategy has been established. And, and now implementing it is another issue. Uh, Sorry, I'm yeah. muted. That's uh, the problem. The problem is we have a lot of strategies and plans, yeah. but no implementation. And, and, and you know, that's, that's why we, we are where we are today. Um, Nasib David is asking, we should focus on data that can screen our need of raw material and check what is needed for food industry and focus our investments in these sectors, right? Definitely. Definitely, when, whenever you want to export, again, exporting is not an easy process. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like, okay, today um, uh, I, I would like to, I don't know, I would like to export my product. It's not an easy process. The first thing that you need to do is market research identifying greedy market demand and addressing a challenge or a gap, or unless you're, you're taking it in a different approach by selling only the diaspora. So even if you are selling to a diaspora, you have to check who are your competitors, at which price margin, do you have the financials, do you have the capability, do you have the production capacity, do you have the certifications, again, depending on uh, different markets that you're planning to export to. So I always believe data is very important to understand the dynamics of the market that you're trying to export. Even in Lebanon, the market dynamics has changed. Things that was before the crisis had a different approach and now we are approaching it in a different way because of the crisis. So uh, um, definitely for the, for the data analysis or uh, uh, grabbing data or uh, obtaining data. Yumna, you are yes. <laughs> George Sharabati is saying, are SME farmers benefiting financially from current investments in agri-food or will they have to be kept outside the new added benefits like in the past and stay poor? Gabby. Gabby. Oh, are you, I, Gabby. Are they, are they, be, are, oh are they benefiting? Video. Sorry, <laughs> the question is, are they benefiting from? From current investments in agriculture. From current investments in agriculture? Are, are farmers, I mean, are poor the, farmers? 
I mean, I can tell you the investments in agriculture right now are very, very low uh, mm. because there's no financing in the country. I mean, it's impossible to even get a loan or financing. So uh, the investments are self-financed. So meaning that whoever invests is benefiting themselves. <laughs> um, I don't think there's much kind of like grand investments um, considering, you know, that there's just no, no finance in the country right now, which is a huge, huge issue. Um, are there funds so, for this project? This is a, another question, Radir Hamid. Well, are there funds that you said it was very difficult to get funds, but uh, it's it's impossible to get a loan now. No one is giving loans. It's impossible to get uh, any type of financing uh, for your for your uh, for your uh, for a project. Mm -hmm. So you would either have to self finance, meaning figure out a way to get money outside of the banking system, um, and then. Uh, look for kind of probably co-investments with other uh, programs, maybe donor funded programs in, in, the, in, in the country. But um, right now there's just no, no money going around. That is, that is some, some program uh, by the USAID or uh, uh, many other embassies that are uh, giving some grants for farmers, uh, but uh, it's still comparably, it's, it's still too small. Minimum. Yeah, it's minimum. Yeah, it's not uh, to move the needle, meaning, you know, I mean, if you're talking about like investments that, you know, move an entire sector up, that's not, uh, that's not really around. It's not available. I mean, it's grants, of course it's grants, but I mean like market-led financing, it's not. It's not All right, well let's, well, let's talk about what you need or what you think the focus should be to make this sector grow again. A lot of our attendees are part of the youth. The youth, I believe, being really the yeah. key, the key, um, solution, the key people that will actually hopefully move the country forward uh, because the this generation and the last one obviously messed it up. So what do you think the focus should be that we can work on to make the sector grow again? And um, how can we convince tech savvies that there are opportunities in this sector? This is your, this is your selling pitch, oh. experts. Okay. So um, do you want me to go? You all have to go, including you, Jad. I see you enjoying your <laughs> enjoying your your couch and your beautiful background, but you're gonna have to go too. Okay. I'll go last this time. I'll all go right. last. All, right. all right, go ahead, Gabby, if you want to start, and then Fadi and then okay, Jad yeah, and sure. Help. I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll just. There's many things you can do, but I'll stick to two points that kind of relate right. to the tech program. One is one is uh, you know some kind of um, initiative around access to finance, um, meaning trying to create some kind of um, financing scheme that can bring in money into uh, the country, into a fund, and to, in order to kind of get, get the sector moving. Um, I think that's the number one uh, kind of uh, initiative that's needed, something around financing. Second is kind of connecting, uh, is helping uh, agriculture processes with sourcing. Um, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a mess out there. I think in terms of uh, sourcing, I think Jack could tell you. Um, and I think uh, initiatives that help farmers understand uh, where they can get their products and what they should grow, how they should grow it and who to sell it to um, and link them with a, pro with a processor is, uh, it would be a, you know, a winner uh, in this country. It just, you just need transparency and information. You just need, people need to understand. You just need transparency. It's that easy. It's that easy. Yeah. Just transparency. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to use the word. I didn't want to use the word blockchain, but uh. <laughs> Jad, Jad, do you want to you want to go next? Uh, actually, um, uh, they should be a, a gov governmental uh, protection for the local produced products. Uh, actually, we, we we are facing competition inside uh, uh, Lebanon uh, before, but right now because of the pandemic, we're uh, uh, the situation is protecting us, so people are buying local uh, produced product, but. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, as well, uh, I think. Hello. We can hear you. We can all hear you. All right. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, and and fund definitely. We need we need the funding. Uh, so we're buying everything in in fresh dollar from uh, from abroad, uh, like the packaging, uh, some raw materials. Actually, eighty percent of the raw materials are are imported. So uh, we need as well uh, to substitute uh, those uh, raw materials in order to help us uh, 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 produce and export those products to uh, uh, 
uh, abroad. Okay. Fadzi? Yeah, well, um, I, I, see, I see always things from a different perspective. I see them from the market. I mean, always I start from the market and then I go backwards. I don't rely too much on government support, especially in Lebanon, but even in the whole world, the government support to agriculture is always minimal. But if we go, the market is there now because of the situation, we can say that we have a gap in the market, whether it's local or export. And, um, and uh, so if the market is there, I think now that we have to go backwards. So who's selling the processed food and the uh, gap said that there's uh, lots of oranges being sold and so on. So agri fresh agricultural products, processed foods are being exported. So we have a market. The local ma market is becoming empty. So we have a market. So the market is there, it's growing. Now we need to supply the market. And, um, and in order to do that, we, we have to start from the basic, which is agriculture. Uh, and I agree with Gav, agriculture has to be developed and encouraged. Uh, as the lady said one of the days that we have lots of lands that are not being developed because mm -hmm. it wasn't it, because it was not uh, feasible to do it. It, wa it was costly and it couldn't uh, bring back uh, a profitable return. So uh, in order to be able to develop this agriculture, you said something about the uh, tech savvies. Uh, okay, yes. These, the, the tech savvies will come to agriculture when they see that they are, when it's sustainable for them. Otherwise, why should they go to agriculture? They would go to other sectors. And this is what's happening in Lebanon. Well, how do we make the sector Yeah, so the use, the use is not going to agriculture. That's why we are seeing that every year the use is uh, less, less use is investing in agricultural sector because it's, it's, it's a sector that doesn't make them live, that they cannot sustain a decent mm -hmm. life by going into agriculture. Today, there is an opportunity because agriculture is now linked to the, uh, is becoming the main supplier of food in the country, whether it's for export or for the local market, and it needs to be done in a proper way. Otherwise we will fade again. So we, it's not a question of farming, it's farming in a modern way, in a cheap way, in, in a way that uh, could, I could export uh, farming with the right specifications that the industry can also benefit from it and so on. So it's a, it's a chain that has to start from the agriculture sector. It has to be developed in a way that it could supply the industry. Uh, and the industry has a market today for the local and for the export. And it should supply also the fresh market because it's, uh, and then uh, I don't see why a, a farmer should be poor. Um, um, on the contrary, a, a farmer is uh, uh, the, the agricultural business is a risky business, and uh, and that's why people don't like to finance. That's why they it's not giving funds. Banks don't like them because they are not sure if they give them money that they are going to get it back again. They are financed by the fertilizer companies and by the pesticide uh, pesticide companies. Uh, if uh, there is only microfinance existing, as that said, uh, USA projects and other projects that are providing some kind of microfinance to the agriculture, but not big, large amounts. So the, the thing is that if the, the, uh, the farmer has a, a client, which is the industry, and has a client, which is the fresh market, the risk is much low on him, and then he can start making money if he takes care, if he does his job well. Uh, uh, climate is an important factor, but also uh, the, the biggest problem, I think, in Lebanon, in agriculture, is the know-how is, the, is yes. the how the know-how how to produce uh, uh, something with minimal problems with minimal uh, cost with uh, op optimizing the production uh, 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 mitigating the risks like uh, climate and and, uh, and and water and so on and, and this is uh, where we need to, to focus on this is where the tech service can help but they need to feel that there's uh, also a return for them that they are not investing their time in something whether they invested in somewhere else or another country, they can make much more money. Uh, so it is, a, it is a challenge, but I think now is the time. Now is the time for Lebanon to, uh, to, to, to um, if you want, flourish its agricultural sector and agri-food sector. Because it's, uh, it's, uh, there is at least one or two years of gap. Definitely imports are going to be reduced, definitely uh, uh, raw material is not going to be available um, uh, as much as we like to. Definitely money is not going to be there. So we need to rely on our own resources. And this is, uh, this is the opportunity. 
Um, but if you do, if you miss it, it's coming two years. We didn't uh, until now. It's a very chaotic situation. Like, yes. I don't want to be negative, but uh, I have to tell people the way it is. And I'll take the now, positivity, Fatih. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is a very chaotic situation now, and nothing is very clear. But I think the way it's going to develop is in this direction. The agriculture, the people, the farmers are going to start seeing that there are, there's a need for their products, and people are going. There's going to be a lot of linkages between the agriculture and the industry, the agriculture and the fresh market, and even for whether it's export or local market. And this is what's going to trigger the, I think, the dynamics. But it's it's going to take time, and it requires some money. But I'm some sure some money, it, some money. Yeah, but this money is going is coming if there is a feasibility. Well, I want to get back. There's a question yeah. from our audience on farmers. I just want Hill to, to, to wrap okay. it up uh, and answer this question, and then we continue with some audience questions. Uh, Yumna, I guess uh, everybody pitched the right, uh, the, the right info, but I come with Fadia on market demand. Would you check what's, what the market needs and you go for it? And right. now we have, to be very, uh, we have to be very transparent again, like Gabby said. The game has changed. The industry needs the farmer and the farmer needs the industry. So there's this trust, this relationship is, is going to be built again. And this is what's actually happening. I know there's right. a lot of bad example and there's a lot also of good example, but now right. it's the time to invest in each other. Now is the, is the time to work as a community between the industry and the farmer. Because as an industry, I would love to purchase at a good cost from the farmer at within these specification. And he will become as a partner with me and the farmer will be securing his income and not becoming poor. Uh, I'm reading also the comments because he wasn't, uh, I don't know, they didn't commit or they uh, they purchased from someone else at a cheaper right. price and right. all of that. Right. That's why this trust should be established. And a lot of companies, for example, uh, the pickle producer are working like that. Again, there's. I, I always say you have positive and negative. I'm just focusing on both. So we're not again living in La La Land. But now this is the time that these relationships should be built. We should focus on sustainable agriculture, not doing agriculture like, okay, what you are doing today, let's plant one, two, three. I'm not an agriculture expert, uh, Gabe. <clears throat> We can talk about more on that but there's like you have to use drip irrigation you have to use crop rotation at in certain crops you have you have different specifications for uh, the food industry and even with the, within the same variety i want uh, i wanted this uh, for example people who does stuffed zucchinis for example ready to eat i don't want you to, to give me the stuffed zucchini it's that much or it's very uh, big or it has a lot of water percentage there's specific measures that the industry should work with the farmer to reach that uh, specification. So I think this trust, this relationship based on what the market needs, either locally or internationally, right. should be established. And now is the right time, as Fadi said. Definitely it needs investment, def but there's a lot of investors at the moment looking to invest in the Lebanese uh, industries. There's a lot of projects supporting or giving a push for people who are willing to invest and do stuff. Uh, and also I'm working, for example, with producers who their distributor is supporting and investing with them on specific lines, for example. There are opportunities. We just have to sort of work harder and identify. And okay. there, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, um, they keep, thank you, thank you experts for answering those questions. There seems to be a, um, they keep asking, you know, you, you mentioned packaging a lot and the packaging yeah. costs being one of the major issues for producers and generally. So Christina, Christine Zeka is asking, why not consider the reuse of packages, especially for glass containers such as bottles, and put in place a procedure, right? When you, when you, why not do that? Like when you have the problem and you know the solution is there, and like you know, especially now recycling and and reusage for the yeah. for the things that cost highly. So, I think it's a great idea. I mean, it's I, a great I idea. think uh, I mean, especially now, I can tell you, a year, two years ago. Prior yeah. to October 2019, it wasn't feasible. It wasn't feasible because we were getting the glass and all right. that stuff was, was cheap coming in. Now it is. You know, packaging glass jars make up 50% of our, you know, a small glass jar is three, 4,000. makes up 50, more than 50% of a, a cost of a product. And so it's a great idea. It's just someone needs to do it. <laughs> and someone needs to think through how it, it's not. 
No, there are initiatives exactly, that it, are doing it. There are it needs, initiatives uh, that are doing it. No, yeah. no, yeah, but it needs to be it needs to be more sustainable, it needs to be mm-hmm. self financed, needs to exactly, be self funded, it needs to think it needs to think about people that are I mean, I can I can think of three or four producers off the top of my head that have uh, expensive uh, bottles that they use for um, their, you know, to pack their raw material. And I, I've always wondered if, you know, if there was some kind of like a business model uh, that would collect these bottles and wash them, you have to wash them mm-hmm. and you have to then redistribute. You have to be the one sanitizing. Let me just tell you that you can't just be giving uh, dirty bottles back to the producers because um, cleaning and disinfecting is very expensive and each company can't do it. So you should have a centralized kind of like, you know, sanitization kind of, uh, you know, factory. And then maybe you can redistribute or resell, you know, that packaging for half the price back to the producers. But it has to be market driven. It has to be profit. It's not a charity. So you have to think this, about this. that. Right, right. So, if it, so in other words, what you are saying, and I've heard all of you say this, is, you know, this, this crisis, whether it's the pandemic that has exacerbated the already existing uh, economic situation, is an opportunity for the country uh, to move forward and to attract young minds and young talent. It is. But it is. Yeah, it is. I'm telling you, it is. It is. Financing, uh, financing not, is not easy. People. Yeah, financing. <laughs> All right. So let's just, I want to take a question from Rami Boujaudé. How can we build and structure such relationships between processors and farmers? Contract farming is a standard process internationally. In Lebanon, many farmers are not willing to commit so what could be the right approach? Again, a question about farmers and their know-how. Uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> excuse yes. me. Yes. In my opinion, we should automate and collect data. Data mining is very important. So uh, 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 the farmers need to know what we need as raw material, as a producer, and uh, we should post as well what is needed. So data mining and, and, and uh, being able to reach uh, the need of all the uh, uh, producers and uh, the farmers know ahead that we know these kinds of products uh, could help a lot as well. And bringing external fund as well to help them uh, uh, produce uh, some raw materials for the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, sector. Uh, Yumna, I'm going to answer that by giving a really a hardcore example that happened and that was the pickle, the cucumber one. What the funding Mm -hmm. agency did when we were working together, we bought the risk of the farmer. The farmer risk was, okay, if I planned the variety and it didn't work, who who would pay me? Was Mm -hmm. it the industry? Who, me? Who's buying the risk? So part of the development project that I used to work with, which was uh, funded by USA, they bought the risk of the farmer. We came and said, okay, this industry wants wants you to, uh, to, uh, to plan these varieties. If it doesn't work, we buy the risk, but the second time it would be the industry. And, and it was an example of, of uh, it's like a ripple effect. What happened is that one company did it, who committed with that farmer. And from one farmer, we moved to 12 farmers with three industries. So definitely, definitely what things can do, if uh, just to, to, ensure the, to ensure the trust and to ensure this relationship at the beginning, because I understand the farmer, he's, he's afraid. Because if he lost, he lost everything, that's one. Who would compensate him? That's two. And mm-hmm. also, if he doesn't have the know-how, he doesn't know uh, what type of fertilizer or what type of pesticide. Again, Gabby asked, uh, I can answer the technical questions more than me. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in agriculture. But this relationship could be supported by funding agency to buy the risk. And even the industry can set a model for, uh, for the risk to support the farmers because they, they, he, he will be his partner. He's not like... I will buy from you this year and next year I won't buy from you because he will grow with him eventually. And this was not be, this, the, the pandemic and the crisis changed this relationship towards that direction. And that's why now a lot of food industries are working like that. Before you didn't, very few industries had an agricultural engineer who, who followed up with their uh, farmers. And upon receiving, they used to check the quality, the pesticide, and all of that. Now, every, everybody is going to that direction because they need this agriculture to produce within the specification they want. If they want to export, they are driven by the export, by the demand. If I want fresh dollars, I need them to support me correctly. So that's, this is my, at least this is how I see it in an approach uh, taking, and it was a good example. It, it succeeded, and they're still working mm-hmm. together, all of these farmers with these three uh, industries. I don't know if any of any one of them are here, 
I would love if they can give an example. But I, I want to, yeah. So before each of you goes, please in the comment section, leave your email and your contact info for our attendees to be able to reach out to you because I do want this conversation to keep going. We're getting a lot of questions, uh, trying to get all of them answered. But I have, um, I also wanted to touch on one thing before we, we close. You know, Smart Gourmet, for example, is a, an example that, of, 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 a, of a success story, if you will, that is expanding to the US and Canada. So what was the main factor, you know, because when you're thinking today of making something work here, you need to also think globally. I think this is what 2021 and, and, and so forward is going to be. So what were the main factors that helped this business expand and go internationally? Can you tell us? Um, actually two things, uh, in fact. So uh, promoting the Lebanese cuisine and you know that the Lebanese cuisine is among the top 10 cuisine uh, uh, in the world. In the world. Uh, so we're, uh, we're uh, producing uh, Lebanese ready to eat products. This is one thing. And uh, the second thing is the innovation that we have invented. So uh, we have invented the, the way to extend the ready to eat shelf life up to one year without using any preservatives and making healthy with, with, the, with, the, with the full nutri nutrition uh, uh, nutrients inside. So basically uh, uh, those two factors uh, uh, simulated a lot of people to put, uh, 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 to invest with us and uh, to expand our reach uh, to the North American region. And um, uh, recently as well, we have signed a contract to uh, uh, start uh, uh, a new factory as well in, in Europe. So uh, this could be for, for a, a one year or a one year and a half project. But right now on June, we're gonna start producing in, in, uh, in uh, 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 US in Canada actually and uh, and catering for the US uh, market from the Canadian uh, factory so we can help as well we need some raw materials uh, 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 some raw materials could be shipped from Lebanon to be produced abroad or uh, some some uh, 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 full products could be produced in Lebanon let's say stuffed vine leaves if we succeeded to get the right uh, 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 vine leaves produced in Lebanon, so we can uh, produce it and ship it and rebrand it in our factory there after controlling uh, uh, the the uh, 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 the safety and and uh, uh, re uh, uh, distributing the same product into the market. So uh, stuffed yeah. vine leaves being exported would make a lot of people happy. <laughs> that's it, it, it's yeah, that's it, 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 I'm not I'm not even joking I'm not even joking it's so true because uh, you know what you know, is the, the, the ready to eat concept is very innovative because stuffed wine leaves is already being exported in a can it's, it's already okay. exists. right even but it's, but that, that makes it processed Jad but at least you get your stuffed vine leaves in Canada or wherever you are Yanni um sure. do you you know this this whole program of Berry Tech is about young talent that are that want to be innovators that come up with ideas and hopefully can scale them up and turn them into business opportunities and successful businesses in closing if each of you could just give one piece of advice um, to these hopefully these applicants or these um, aspiring entrepreneurs I should say and uh, and we'll leave it at that and please speakers Jad Fadi Gabby and Hill, leave your contact info so that we can continue this conversation, if you don't mind. And go on ahead, your piece of advice to our future entrepreneurs. I, do I start? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm go typing ahead. in my email. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think one and always one, go by market demand, address a challenge, mm. address a gap. You cannot, uh, you cannot have, you can have a beautiful idea, a beautiful product, but it's simply, it's not sellable. It's not the right time. And I've seen that a lot with different industry where they had a perfect product, but it wasn't the right time for launching. There was no culture. There's no awareness on the product. There, there wasn't a gap for it, or it was a lot of avant-gardiste. So I think market demand always addressed a gap. Uh, that's one. And now due to the pandemic, one of the things that are easy now, is you can actually test your product on online platforms before going into a huge investment and going to retail. And uh, this is something that we do, for example, when I'm working for the US market, the first thing I do is I check on Amazon, example, hummus. I will check how many, 
cakes I have on Amazon, uh, on, on hummus, for example. And I see, for example, I have, if I put hummus, I will have, I don't know, 700 products. Deb, okay, if I want to do it, what, uh, what would be my unique selling point? Or what is, what would it be different for my product to sell there? So online pl platforms are really a great tool to test your product before going into retail and before partnering with someone in the export market or the local market, because it's really important to have a partner whenever you are selling your product in local market or export market, because this is the key changer for you, along with your definitely product certification, along the other, uh, other stuff that are market and legal requirements. So these are my two uh, advices at least for the moment. All right. Thank you. Uh, press, type your email and contact info for us. Yeah. Um, who wants to go next, Jad or Gabby? Okay. For oh, he'll, uh, he'll stole my Fadi, Fadi will end with you, the godfather yeah, of our speaker. <laughs> um, okay, regarding the, the as, as a manufacturer, actually, uh, I advise uh, everyone uh, stepping into this uh, arena is to focus on the food safety and uh, regulation because you cannot ex export any products from here before uh, getting uh, uh, a certification like uh, ISO, BRC, at least, uh, ISO at least, BRC is, is a must uh, for the North American region uh, uh, to export your product. So food safety uh, is, is uh, uh, key. a top priority, uh, the key, exactly. And for the, uh, 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 as well, the manufacturers here, uh, so they need to automate the process. So uh, automation, uh, industrialization in, in, in automation, let's say in the vine leaves, soft vine leaves usually is done by hand. So uh, we have developed our own machine to industrialize this uh, process because uh, uh, getting the market, uh, a big market, getting into a big market like USA and Canada, you cannot, hire people to stop buying these by hand and the hygienic mm -hmm. approach as well is a big issue as well mm -hmm. so uh, 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 definitely if uh, someone wants to export up outside lebanon uh, uh, the certification is a must even in local they should have a minimum of traceability system and basic uh, food safety requirements even for Lebanon, for Lebanese right. and yeah, Lebanese. we should we should aim high even locally, don't you think, yeah. Jad? <laughs> Not just for abroad, but locally because of the um, the corruption and the constant criticism we get for our sector. If that, if we've done it for for the export, definitely we have it for the local as well. So hopefully, uh, that's not necessarily true though, as and, we've and, seen. But for us, definitely our process mm. that we have invented is a curing process. So definitely is something that uh, we've taken seriously into consideration. So our product, if uh, nobody knows that it is sterilized. So uh, uh, even even salmonella and, uh, and, and Listeria cannot live in our hummus. So, uh, yes. uh, All right. so we've taken this seriously for the local and for the export market. All right. Fadi or Gabby, who wants to go first? Okay, can I? Yes, Fadi, please. Okay. Um, of course, uh, what has been said, uh, I agree, but the sense of not going to repeat it. I, I think it's uh, all good advice. What I would like to add is that uh, uh, in innovating is an important aspect if you want to actually succeed in, in, in this agri-food sector because it is, by definition, a very traditional sector. And uh, what we do today is being done everywhere in the world. So what, what, it's important what we're going to add to it. And this is, requires a, a, a true collaboration between the, the farmer, the producer, and the innovators. It could be researchers or, or universities or, or people with, with, with experience. And this, these three can, the, give us um, a level of uh, an, an output which could uh, make us more successful and make a more added value to the products and and hence will make this sector even more prosperous. Uh, I don't think if we follow just always the, the, the classical way we can become competitive even with this even with the opportunities we have today uh, the, I mean the crisis the financial crisis and pandemic. We need to start making use of the fact we have this opportunity to go to the next level, which is developing a, 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 
a good a food sector with a high reputation and with innovative products. So in the same way, I mean, this is, if you look at Smart Gourmet, this is what makes them successful, is that they went to a, to the next level and they looked at the innovative aspect. And, uh, and I think this is how, this is one of the things, one of the uh, act actions that the food processor should focus on is how to work with the with other, other partners in the sector. They cannot do everything. They cannot be the farmer, the producer, the researcher, the marketeer, the export. Mm -hmm. They have to work with others. It's a chain. And I think they have, we have to learn how to work together. And this will make, uh, definitely, we can be, become successful. I have no doubt about this. That's that's good. That's that's good advice. And thank you for staying positive about this and, and optimism. I love the optimism today. No, Gabby, do you want to? I have. There are a few more questions that I just want to get in. But Gabby, do you want to just tell us, just conclude here? With sure, sure. I'll uh, keep it short and sweet. But you know, I think it's important to to know how much you have to produce to make money. Meaning that, and you know, people don't do a, a simple financial calculation. You know, they say, okay, I'm just going to make uh, strawberry jam, but they don't realize they have to make 500 tons of strawberry jam in order yeah. to survive. And so, you know, I mean, and, you know, how much you produce equals cash flow. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you start doing the calculations, you're going to say, oh man, I need to buy 500 tons of cucumbers. First, how am I going to pay for that? And then I have to sell it. And then it's 500 tons, or am I going to keep them? And, you know, start with, you know, you have to just know how much you need to buy and how much you need to sell in order to be happy, in order to pay for your rent or pay for your house or pay for your car. Um, thank you for that. Just a quick question. Some people are asking, you know, can we still invest in non-young talent? I, of course, I keep always mentioning young talent because I think about the youth and the future, but also there are people that have been doing it for a long time that want to adapt, uh, people who have expertise. So. Just in, in closing, how can we invest in non-young talent? And peep, this is one part of the question. And question two is, um, those who want to know what the market needs are so that they can invest in agriculture, how can they do that? So two different questions, two sides of the coin. Okay. Um, uh, yes, guess, yes. Hail. Hill, uh, we're, uh, Hill, uh, Hill, we're loving you. We're loving you. <laughs> they are asking questions because you're answering. That's really what it is. Okay. Um, in terms of market, what are the trends? Again, um, not to promote another uh, uh, learning series because tomorrow we have another session with, uh, uh, with Kut on market trends and specifically Netherlands. Uh, the thing is, you have to choose first which market you want to go to to identify the market trends. As Jad said, Mediterranean diet or Mediterranean lifestyle has been ranked number one for the four times in a row in the health US and use for the fourth time. So all the ingredients and versatility of the product of the ingredient are being promoted. And this is, uh, this is marketing without you putting a dime. Example for the US market. So you really need to take that product from a Mediterranean perspective. Again, I'm talking about our Lebanese product. We can innovate whatever, whatever the trend needs. But one simple example, I'm going to give it because now it's, um, it's no longer confidential, for example, for the U.S. market. For example, dressings, Mediterranean dressings now are booming, tabbouleh dressing, fatouche dressing, and there are people working. And another example that is perfect is the tomb. We all Lebanese diaspora love tomb, and now tomb is being recognized as a dip so for antibacterial, <laughs> yeah, as a dip for or everything. anything. Yeah. So really, tomb, for example, uh, is a, is a really innovative product and can be packaged in so multiple ways, either a squeeze bottle or an actual dip or whatever that market needs. I'm just giving example that has succeeded that I personally worked with for the past two years to penetrate to the US market. Mm -hmm. So, but that was done based on what are the trends? What are the right packages for that product? Who am I targeting? So these information, either you are working with a consultant or you are getting, you're purchasing the data. You have a lot of uh, market research database where you can get the data, bill of lading, what are the products from retailers, and this is all paid. So you can choose whatever whatever um, option is good for you to, uh, to get this data, okay? Right. And then start saying, okay, I will work because this is my advantage here. I can work like that or I can work like that. 
So this is really for the first question. The second question where non-young non -young people or non, yeah, I don't know what young, everybody. People who, are, people, people who are experienced in the industry is maybe how I would put it. Uh, we have a lot of industries that they have a good product, but they haven't launched it yet. It could be mm -hmm. uh, improper branding. Sometimes your brand is a hindrance because your brand does not translate good in another country or in right. due to different culture barriers or uh, languages or stuff like that. So really, there's a lot of challenges that uh, that faces the product and faces the company that needs to be dissected. Again, with the SWOT analysis, I'm not going to go technical, but yeah. really, you, have, you always, for me, at least, Everything I think of is market demand. What does the market need in yeah. which markets? And I work backwards. Yes. Do I need equipment to, like Jad saying, he developed an equipment to do the vine leaf because if he wants to go mass, he cannot keep it on regular um, hand rolling. And because of the hygienic, every time they need to sanitize their hand, they put their hand or whatever. So he developed for him, that was the market. He took it one step backward. He needed an equipment. Jad, I'm dissecting your case study. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, Thank you. And he's Thank identifying you. a farmer for the vine leaf. So he, he, he has all the elements of success, in my opinion, definitely. And, and he doesn't need even my, uh, my statement because he's doing a good job and he's getting the result of this good job. So this is how you get the market first. And then you start going up, not backwards, actually. It's like you're making sure what are the gaps in your industry or in your product to, uh, to meet that market demand or challenge. And you yeah. can take RX Bar as a very good example. He's a Lebanese guy who started with his uh, and his RX Bar. What's his name? One. What's his name? Uh, Peter Rahal. He's an RX Bar. It's uh, it's now it's acquired by Kellogg's for six hundred million dollars. It started with a ten thousand dollar in his basement. He addressed a challenge, which is the bar with the spirit of no bullshit. So he writes on his first package like uh, ten dates, two egg whites, whatever, and no bullshit. And the guy started, he tested his product on online. He started yeah. getting, and it's all, it, he has an innovative product. He answered a gap or a challenge in the US market where you have a million energy. He has, he has an inno innovative approach, right? Good exactly. marketing helps a lot. Good marketing. And after also. four years with, a, with an investment of $10,000, he got acquired by Kellogg's. Yeah. So you can do it, just, just Listen, answer. There are, yeah. And I think this is the best thing. To, 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 to the biggest takeaway today is, you know, uh, and he's are, Lebanese. Yes, there are opportunities. <laughs> there are, op I think, the biggest, the best, the takeaway today is there are opportunities for Lebanese, and that's really, I think, one of the missions of Barry Tech's series and the Agri Tech uh, sessions. Um, just before I let you go, speakers, to help you submit the best possible application and increase your chances to all our applicants, because the the deadline is in six days. Uh, we are inviting you to join the fourth batch of the AgriTech Accelerator. No, actually to increase your chances of joining it. We would like to invite you to a Q&A session with the Accelerator Manager, Mario Ramadan, to answer all your questions regarding the application forms, the selection process, and all the perks and support you will receive during AgriTech batch four. So how you're gonna come in on that, but before that, I just wanna thank Hill, Fadi, Gabby, and Jad for answering all our questions. Hill, thank you for the enthusiasm and the energy <laughs> and the optimism. And, and I, you know, I mean this, I say it seriously just because we are going through one of the most difficult periods in, in Lebanese history. This is not even an exaggeration. And I think the pandemic, but also Lebanon facing its own economic and political and turmoil issues. Um, so the fact that you can inject some optimism and really try to boost young talent and non-young talent uh, experts and um, and beginners is a blessing and we are very grateful so thank you to Barry Tech and thank you speakers for being with us today I'm sure they'll they'll reach out to you sorry you had to give your emails but it's all part of the mentee mentoring um, mm -hmm. and please please feel free to reach out attendees I think our speakers I mean they're saying it in front of us but I think they'd be willing to answer your questions and I myself will keep this going as well um, and uh, on that note, Soha, do you want to come in and say a few words? We're ending I it. Like, I would like uh, to thank you, Yumna. Thank our panelists. Uh, the sessions were great. Thank you for the uh, participants for uh, their questions and uh, added value. And uh, thank you so much. That's it. All right. Thank you. Well, speakers, be mm. safe. Uh, thank you. Keep the good word thank out you. there. Hale, I will reach out to you personally. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Gabby, tell, 
tell them to keep investing in our in our sector. <laughs> <laughs> all okay. right. Uh, you know, I just want to say thank you for everyone and all the uh, the panels. So thank you, Fadi, Jad, and Gabi. Thank, thank you. you uh, thank you a lot, Toha. Thank you, Barry Tech, for giving us an opportunity. And as you said, I always believe if you love your job, Yumna, not a job, if you love what I do, you love what you do, you just always inject positive vibes. Even if you are in a really, really bad situation, there's always a silver lining outside. Like I, I, had I, believe, I believe that. <laughs> I truly believe that. So thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank on that you. note, take care and thank you. Uh, stay safe. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank, Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye. Saha, bye. <laughs> well, see you tomorrow. <laughs> I will try to jump in. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Bye. bye.